Welcome everyone. Happy Mother's Day to all the mums. I'd like to introduce Andrew. Andrew Boyle's with us until the end of June and he's Welcome Andrew. Hi Andrew. In you we live and have our being. You are not far from all of us. You are all around us and within us. You are our safe haven, our living God. You are our creator who made galaxies and yet are mindful for us. So we give you our thanks and praise. Jesus, our Lord, our Redeemer, calling us forward and making us one people of God, you unite us in your love. We give you our thanks and our praise. Holy Spirit, life giver and love bearer, you knit us together as the community of God. And you lead us on, calling us forward and pouring God's love into our hearts that brings tears of joy and healing for our soul. We give you our thanks and praise. So come Holy Spirit, come upon us today and pour God's love into our hearts so we may know God's abundant grace and blessings. And the prayer of confession is, Lord, these are challenging times, yet here we are willing to make a commitment to share and care for one another as one united family in Christ. So in this moment of silence, 
We come before you with all that's on our hearts, seeking your forgiveness. Then Christ's words of grace to us, your sins are forgiven. Um, with the next hymn, are you able to stay seated and sing it prayerfully? Yes, yes it's come Holy Spirit, our souls inspire. I think that um, when we sing that on Pentecost Sunday, we'll have the choir leading us. <laughs> it sounds like you haven't sung that before. Is that right? Yeah. It's a beauty. When it's sung, it's beautiful. So how about we have that on Pentecost Sunday with the choir leading us? Yeah. I think so. <laughs> it's a beautiful song. Okay, we're going to have the scripture readings. The first reading this morning is from the New Testament um, book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 16 to 32. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also, some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and asked him, 
May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and I looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made of human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From our ancestor he made all nations to inhibit, inhabit the whole earth, and he allocated the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed in the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed, but others said, we will hear you again about this. The second reading is from the letters of Peter, 1 Peter 3, 12 to 22. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer from doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always, always, sorry. Um, be ready to make your defence to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear, so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if suffering should be God's will than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteousness for the unrighteousness, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through the water. And baptism, which was prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, 
but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God for, with angels, authorities and powers made subject to him. And our final reading today is from John 14, 15 to 21. And it's headed, The Promise of the Holy Spirit. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you. Forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because he neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. <coughs> they who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. This ends our reading this morning. We have any children today to help us? Oh, big hand up. Okay. Made up differently. Oh. Mm -hmm. Some families are tall, yes. So at school, what are families like? Your friends, what kind of families have they got? So, so this is this picture there. I love my family. This is, um, and these are the things I love most, my mum and dad. You've got mum and dad, you've got Mother's Day today. Yes. And this, this little bunny has um, a sister. You've got a sister. And a brother. Not a brother. No? Hmm? They're both. They're, oh, okay. All right. And a cat. Do you, have a, you don't have a cat, do you? No? A rabbit and... Oh, and goldfish. Okay. Oh, you are going to get a dog. Ooh. Oh, do you do this? Do you go rafting in the water or in the boats at the Yarra? Yeah. Oh. Who's been on the Yarra in a boat? You know, the, is it Studley Park? You have? Very good. You didn't. No? At the oh. So mum and dad are good at helping me work out the right way to do things and to make good choices. Do you think that, yeah, they help? Sometimes. <laughs> if I have a problem, I know they're always there to listen and help me. That's true. So mum and dad are good at telling me when I do something wrong or naughty. Oh, do you get told when you do something naughty? Because everyone can identify with that, can't you? <laughs> yes. Then when you get to be parents, you find out your parents were probably right <laughs> when you've got kids. <laughs> yes, they're good at this. And so when I've been naughty, I know they still love me. That's true, isn't it? Yeah, they're just, try they're just trying to help me with my behaviour. So you look, and their little bunny saying, sorry. I like your pet rocks. Oh, I like it. Oh, look at that. Mum and Dad help me. Um, or help mum and dad 
help everyone in my family feel, isn't that loved, accepted, a sense of belonging? That's, that's tricky, isn't it? Because you're grade one now, aren't you? Yeah, grade one. Trusted, confident, valued, respected, safe and secure and special. Special. That's a tricky one. You, you're getting there. You're doing well. So these are, that's important, isn't it? I, I guess we have our families we come from, but we also have our family now. We're part of a big family now, our church family. And I know that the main characteristic, isn't it, that, is that we all care for one another and look out for each other. And that helps us feel like we belong and we're valued. Oh, okay. You're looking after him and caring. What? I know. Did you hear that? God has a giant family. It's all of us, the whole world. My goodness, he must be very busy, or he or she, I'm not sure. Oh, there's the different size families. Look. My goodness, some of these. Look. Do you know what I have? Six brothers and sisters. Who, who, got, who comes from a large family? Oh, a few hands have gone up. Oh, look, and there's the extended family. My goodness, look at all those bunnies. We, we do, yes. If we got everyone together in our family, cousins and everything, it's quite a crowd. Yes, that's a cute one, isn't it? Yeah, look at this little one. Very cute. Oh. That one's just trying to... You have, re you have a nice headband, yes. That one, yes. It's your sisters. Oh, well, sisters come in handy. There's often special times that we get together, like Mother's Day, Christmas, picnics in the park, oh, Easter egg hunt. Do you? The whole work. Wow, that's a crowd. I'm, I'm sure you enjoy cooking for them. <laughs> Oh, and there's bedtime. Mum and Dad give you... Yeah. And, um, my, I have little grandchildren your age. Do you know that? Yeah. Three grandchildren your age, and they all get quality time or special time or whatever they call it at bedtime. Oh, look, very cute. Oh, they do. They do. My, my dog and cat were very friendly. And there, I love my family. Yeah. So I hope you have a lovely Mother's Day today. Yeah. Thank you. My daughter's 43, giving away my age. I'll be having a Mother's Day. <laughs> We're chalk and cheese, but we, we do our best. <laughs> Now, I hope you know this one. Do you know this one? God is love. Everybody know that one? Oh, I hope so. My goodness. <laughs>
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, open our deaf ears and give sight to our blind eyes, that we may receive your word of grace and rejoice to see your coming kingdom. Amen. I had a gay friend who died of AIDS some years ago now. It's too long ago now when I think about him. He was English born and a bit of an imp at the best of times. He told the story of answering the door at home one day to a couple of Mormons who were doing the rounds of the neighbourhood. Can we come in and pray with you? They asked. Geoffrey put his arm up against the door lintel in a come hither sort of way and said, oh yes, laying on the high camp act rather thickly, do come in. Needless to say, the two young Mormons, very earnest elders, beat a hasty retreat down the street What, of course, Geoffrey was reacting to was a form of evangelism that we've become all too familiar with over the past century. People coming into our space. Of all the churches surveyed in the National Church Life Survey over years, it seems that members of the Uniting Church are the least likely of all church members surveyed to be willing to share their faith with others. Sharing of faith has come to have a certain bad press in our time. Loud, persistent, insensitive, often invasive. Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses banging on the front door Soap box evangelists haranguing the crowds as you pass by in the city. Enormous stadia brim brimming over with crowds, all encouraged to come forward for an altar call. Cheery brochures telling us how wrong we are living and how Jesus can fill the gaping hole in our life as though Jesus is some kind of existential pill to solve all our woes. In our hyper-secular and somewhat cynical Australian social environment, we're a bit suspicious of evangelists and their ways and their wares. Many of us shy a bit, like a twitchy horse when we think Someone is about to give us the good oil. So I find it's not easy to read this episode of Paul's engagement with the Athenians without seeing it through our own eyes, discoloured by a narrow approach to evangelism that has grown up over the last century or so. But here in this passage from the Acts of the Apostles, Paul goes to uh, Athens' Speaker's Corner. I don't remember Speaker's Corner, but some of you might. I had somebody in my first congregation whose father used to drag her off there on a Sunday afternoon. She knew how to do a bit of argy-bargy, actually. She'd she learnt from being on Speaker's Corner. But Paul had gone there to Athens Speaker's Corner to engage with the philosophers who gathered there. It's clearly a lively place of public debate, a place of a bit of push and shove around ideas. The thing for Paul, though, is that he is probably not used to this polytheistic environment. He comes from Israel, from 
uh, country and culture, which is very stridently monotheistic, where Jewish religion and culture and identity, personal and collective identity, are all tied up together. And Jewish life is utterly focused on one temple. While there would have been elements of worship of other divinities in the society from which Paul came, including emperor worship, that is something which would have been pushed and expected in some places, he would not have been used to this abundance of objects of worship as he found in Athens. And more importantly, Paul would also have been profoundly formed by the first commandment of the Decalogue. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth below, or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down and you shall not worship them. Luke, the author of the Acts of the Apostles, tells us that Paul is distressed. He argues in the synagogue, in the marketplace, with anyone who will engage with him. He is called a babbler, a peddler of foreign divinities by the Athenians. Nevertheless, they're curious and he engages with them. He's offering them an image of God who has engaged personally with humanity in Jesus. The one who is not an object made by human hands, but the God who has come to us in human form, made in the image of the one who made the world and everything in it, as Paul says. Maybe this dialogue of Paul's with the Athenians has become a kind of default model of sharing the gospel. But it's not the only one. But we have come to understand that sharing the gospel is about changing people, about convincing them, arguing with them, telling them that they're wrong and seeing that they are converted in some way, like old coal gas stoves to natural gas. My sense is that most people find it an approach which, in spirit, is out of step with the spirit of the gospel. It's not that people's ears are closed. They just don't like being talked down to, patronised something conveyed to them that they've got it all wrong. Given our ambivalence in the Uniting Church about what has come to be understood about uh, as to what evangelism is, I wonder how we might discover again how to do this. I refer to it actually to evangelism as the E word in the Uniting Church because nobody uses it anymore. How might we be able to bring a word which bears something of the life of God for those we meet in life-giving ways, not in obnoxious ways? The church has always proclaimed the necessity of word and deed being deeply inseparable. In the letter of James, his hearers are reprimanded. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but do not have works? In the Uniting Church, we have opted for the works. It seems, it feels to me, without the word. We are the largest social welfare provider in the country through Uniting and Uniting Age Well. But these facilities, in my experience, are utterly lacking in any sign that it is Christian faith which shapes and motivates their work. 
And as I was reflecting uh, on Alison, it was Alison who came two weeks ago from Uniting H Well. Thank you, thank you, Catherine. I just wasn't sure whether I had her name right. She didn't actually mention anything about the faith which informs um, that mission of the church. Why not, I wondered. And when I go into these facilities, they feel like soulless places to me. And it makes me very sad as a minister of this church that there is nothing distinctly Christian, explicitly Christian, uh, about these spaces. Why? Why do we allow ourselves to be silenced in this way? In a world where too many religious people are shouty and prescriptive, how might we find a way to both speak and act in ways that have integrity and respect about them, without fudging about the faith that actually motivates our works? I find the section that we've heard from the first letter of Peter gives us encouragement and guidance about how we might do this. Humbly, respectfully, but with clarity. So we hear from the letter, always be ready to make your defence to anyone who demands from you an account of the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. So reverencing the person we're speaking with, we're dealing with. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. In both the accounts of Paul on the Areopagus and in the letter of Peter, it is others who are inquiring, who are curious. They are making the approach. They are wanting to know what it is that these followers of Jesus believe, what it is that gives them hope. And we might wonder about this because we live in a world where there is not a lot of hope. How might we talk with reverence with people about what gives us hope? My experience is that a lot of people are curious apart from those who know it all and are not, who have all the answers and are keen to let us know that they are right. But I have found that with reverence, with respect, with curiosity myself about my own faith journey, that this posture is invitational, an opportunity for conversation about what matters most deeply for myself which gives permission for others to talk about what is, matters most deeply for them. Nevertheless, it's hard to turn this approach into a marketing campaign, a strategy for winning souls for Jesus. But this, an aggressive marketing campaign is not what we're called to. We're called to being in the way of Christ. If we are abiding in the spirit of truth, then we are resting in peace and joy. And whether someone is able to receive our word or not is actually not our concern. But if we speak with reverence and humility, then maybe they will make it their concern. And be drawn to the one who is the light of life. The gift of the spirit which comes to us from God is the spirit of truth. This is not truth as ideology, but truth of being, an integrity of soulfulness which resonates with others. This is what makes people curious. People can detect it, and they're curious when they detect it. And they can, 
and they can detect when our spirit is out of sync with our words, when we are, as Paul would say, just clanging gongs. So in this Easter season, we pray for ourselves that we may be receptive to the spirit of truth, that we may receive her and abide in her and enjoy and delight in the life of Christ for us. So we sing praise with joy the world's creator. We say the offering prayer together. Lord and giver of every good thing, we bring to our lives and gifts for your kingdom, all for transformation for your grace and love, made known to you, Christ our Saviour. Thank you, Jim. We have the prayers of the people. We'll start our prayers this morning with a beautiful prayer from Bangladesh. O Saviour Christ, in whose way of life lies the secret of all life and the hopes of all people, we pray for quiet courage to meet this hour. We did not choose to be born or live in such an age, but let its problems challenge us, its discoveries exhilarate us, its injustice anger us, its possibilities inspire us and its vigour renew us for your kingdom's sake. Almighty God, we pray for your church. We pray for our congregation that we will continue to grow together. We thank you for the gifts that each brings. 
We pray for our ministers and our leaders, uphold them, grant them energy, wisdom and clarity, and grant us a vision that has you at the centre so that we might reach out to those around us. We pray for other churches, for the Anglican Church of the Ascension in Burwood East and for the Uniting Church Congregation of Christ Church in Kensington. We pray for their worship communities, their members and participants, their special ministries and outreach programs. Bless them, Lord. Loving Lord, we pray for your world and we pray this morning for Bangladesh, Bhutan and Nepal. We pray for efforts of governments and others to build up these nations' economies. For those who've lost families and homes in earthquakes and other disasters, as they struggle to, to rebuild their lives, homes and infrastructure. We pray for those who contribute to religious harmony and advocate for minority voice of Christians and for religious and government leaders that they will make it possible for all peoples to live in justice with peace and harmony. Merciful Lord, we pray for, poor, for the poor, the neglected and the marginalised, we pray for Indigenous people that opportunities for justice, reconciliation, mutual understanding and respect will not be wasted. We pray for displaced people that they will be welcomed as they flee unimaginable circumstances. We pray for victims of war, for perpetrators of war and for the international community. Lord, we pray for peace. We pray for victims of intolerance and bigotry who've suffered injustice, who don't share equally in the wealth of their society and who are discriminated against. And we pray for our governments, local, state, federal, that they will govern for all, that they will govern with compassion, with the most vulnerable at the front. Lord, enable us to be your agents of your love in the world. Lord, we pray this morning for mothers, for the care, the love and the, and the devotion of mothers, for the joys of parenthood and the challenges it brings. And we pray for those for whom today is a day of difficult memories and associations. Lord, we pray for those in special need at this time, for the sick, for the hurting, the lonely, the grieving, we pray for those in our own community, family, loved ones and friends who are suffering hardship, loss or ill health. We entrust them all to your care and we pray that you will surround them with your love. Loving God, we pray all these things through Jesus Christ our Lord who taught us to pray. Our, our Father in heaven, in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is. Give us today our daily bread as we forgive our sins. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And for Jeff, Cheryl and Jeff. Um, 
two other people who've got cancer and I'm not sure whether I've got permission, so I'm going to just silently light a candle for them, so please pray for them. Maui, okay, your mum on Mother's Day? Jenny Belshaw, she's having a tough time. Did she pray for the medical staff helping her to yeah. that yeah. she finds hope? So giving thanks that you're doing so well? Yes. Okay. Okay. A prayer for you, Peter. <laughs> Continued recovery. Yes, it's going to be good for us. Sorry, I missed. Oh, yes. Oh, that was one of, that was for, so it's okay. Yeah, okay. Don's also having a terrible time. Okay, that would be lovely. Yeah. Thanks, Pauline. Sorry? Uh, it's prayers for Don Bain. There's a card. There's a card you can put your name on. Okay. Oh, yes? Yes. For those who come from families where Things were tough and um, relationships weren't so good and, and for families where there's violence of some sort. Not everyone's blessed with a happy family. Praying for peace in Sudan. Um, Miramar and Ukraine. No, South Sudan. South Sudan. Sudan. Miramar. <coughs> oh, that's good. Prayers for Keith for his surgery. Do it. He's, it's gone well for him. that he'll be able to, hopefully in a few months, be able to play for us again. He must be missing that. Stuart? Stuart? Yep. Prayers for Stuart. I'll try not to set myself alight again. Prayers for those who are facing an operation this coming week, some of them major operations. Especially Cheryl, I get Cheryl. Okay, yes. Safe travels for all our members that they're having a great time, a great adventure. I wonder if there's any room in the luggage. <laughs> I'd like to, I haven't had an adventure for a while. It'd be so jealous. It'd be lovely. Yes? Prayers for Phil and his family. 
um, that his wife has passed away and, and prayers for the funeral that's coming up. And this one's for all of the prayers that you haven't said out loud, um, but God knows and is listening. Nice big flame. So I might add prayers for my son and his wife and family, grandchildren to come home safely. Dear Treasury. We're going to sing Morning Has Broken, which is a thing I remember singing that as a child. Please be seated. Have we got any notices? Yes, I have notice. What's your notice? Well, I'll be here next month and I'll just do my Christmas. Oh, lovely. Have a good time. Yeah. Just to remind everybody, if you are making your contribution to the church's work through your bank account, directly through your bank account. There is now a Whitehorse Uniting bank account, which is in the notice sheet, so I'm not going to give you the numbers in case I get one of them wrong. Um, but you do need to um, contact your bank, whether you do that by appearance at the bank, and change the donation. So you need to cancel the current one and institute the new Whitehorse account number. It's in the notice sheet. Um, if you need, need it... Um, in another way, let us know. And for those who are internet fancy, you can uh, log into your bank on your account and, and do it online if you need to. And just a reminder that next week's service will be at Nunawadi. Uh, just reminded everybody that there's five letters to be signed out there today. And these have been created by the Synod and Just Act Group. Um, the letters will be available for signing next Sunday in Nunawaddy for those who miss out today. And thank you for those that are already signed. Um, in a gospel reading today, the dis disciples are anxious about Jesus leaving him. But the promise of the Spirit's presence with them also relates to God's action in the world to which we are called. We hope that in signing these letters today that justice will come to the people in need. Thank you. Uh, before I remind everybody, next week is for the... Um, all volunteers, the dedication, we hope everybody can be there for that. Thank you. We are endeavouring to make sure that at each of our services, wherever they are, there's a copy, a printed copy of the notice sheet, the weekly notice sheet. So when you come to Mitcham, ours are left on the bench on the right hand side as you go out the door. And there's a few there this morning for anyone who needs them. Thank you.
Now, I noticed at Nutterwadding there's a box there where people can put their old glasses. Is that right? Yeah. Almost. Um, I just thought I'd advertise that. I must round up mine. Okay, that's very good. They're sent to, and what happens in Vanuatu? Okay. Okay, so full glasses, not glasses, frames or anything like that or bits and pieces. Is that right? Okay. Oh, very good. Because glasses cost a lot of money, as we all know. Yeah. Okay, yes, and um, as mentioned, we do have a volunteer service next week, so please come along. Um, all of us, I'm sure, have been a volunteer sometime in our life. So it'll be a celebration, but also giving thanks and, and dedication because we have a lot of volunteers amongst us, you know, and we will be looking at the main centres, but that doesn't mean that we're not also going to be celebrating what we all do because there are so many of us are volunteers and don't even tell people what we do, which is wonderful. Um, okay, so let's say the blessing together. We go in peace, in the love of God, in the power of the Spirit. May the Lord bless us. Lord, make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us as we bring Christ's love and peace to the world. Amen. Amen.